Thank you so much for joining The Real Deal for our panel, New to Miami. Now, everyone here on the stage with me is a major player back in New York City, but in Miami, they're just getting started. So I thought, you know, we just talk about some of the challenges establishing themselves in this hot market, why they're here, some of the things they've learned, and what they hope to accomplish. So we'll start on my left is Bess Friedman from Brown Harris Stevens. She manages business development for them, and she is part of, you know, one of the most one of the most respected and oldest brokerages in New York City. Peter Fine, to her left, he is the founder and CEO of Two Better Days Development, which, uh, what is it, 70,000 units, you said, Peter? Not 7,000 7, units in New York City, and he's building luxury spec homes in Miami Beach. To his left, Leonard Steinberg, who's the president of Compass, uh, formerly a top broker at Douglas Elliman, one of the top you know, brokers nationwide, and now he's the president of Compass, a company that is recently valued at $800 million. Andrew Heiberger to his left. Andrew is the founder and CEO of Town Residential, one of the largest and most well-established firms in New York City. Uh, they have a major alliance with Fortune International Group here in Miami, which we'll talk about as well. And then to his left is Ryan Sirhant from Nest Seekers International. He's the principal of the Sirhant team, and you know he's one of the top brokers in New York City. Uh, we recently did an analysis, and we concluded that Ryan has more than half of his firm's listings, which is a phenomenal achievement. Woo! So he is he's also the star of a well-known show, Million Dollar Listing New York, which uh, is pretty addictive, so you might have seen it. Anyway, we'll get started just with a very, very basic question. Why are you guys here? Ryan, let's kick it off with you. Uh, go Heat. <laughs> exactly. That's why we're here. Um, no, people ask me that a lot, actually. And for me, the reason we started doing more and more business down here is just because the client base is the same. And I think if you look around, we just had a lot of clients saying, okay, we're buying a new construction in the city. Uh, we've got a place in LA. Now we want to go to Miami. And that just kept happening and happening and happening. So it said, okay, well, we should go down there and make an establishment and really, really try to get to work. Andrew, you've got a business that you're projecting two and a half billion dollars in closed sales uh, this year. Why, why Miami if you're doing such a great job in New York? Um, <clears throat> uh, Miami is the unofficial sixth borough of, Manha uh, of New York City. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, I have uh, deep roots in Miami. I went to law school here at University of Miami. I've been coming here since 1989. So I'm very familiar with um, the evolution of this city. Um, in addition to that, our clientele, um, like Ryan just explained, our customers and clients are asking us about investing down here. Um, our competition, some of our competition in New York and the competition that's on this stage um, has um, established themselves here also, so it's important for us to do the same. Um, I've decided <laughs> that because of the, um, the dynamic down here, um, that I'm honored um, to work with Edgardo from Fortune International Group and to have a strategic partnership and approach the market in that, in that way. Um, Edgardo has 19 locations, including a huge international presence in, um, in South America. And um, in addition to my clients and customers in New York being interested in Miami, and not only just Miami, South Florida in general, um, <clears throat> my, my, um, my developers also um, are, are conducting a lot of business down here. And in addition to that, um, my brokers, which we call representatives, are very interested in transacting down here also. So there's a multi-tiered platform that Edgardo and I have created together. We launched it in February, and it's working. We have over 30 some odd transactions or potential referrals in process right now. And, um, and I expect the, uh, the relationship to bear uh, many fruits for the years to come. Leonard, do you want to swap suits with me? Or I'm sorry. You want to swap suits with me? I'd love that. Right? Uh, will it fit? <laughs> Ouch. Thank you. But tell me, Leonard, why are you guys here? This is a company that's been growing at, at a pace that is unprecedented in the, in the New York market, certainly in the real estate brokerage uh, space. Uh, the, the growth of Compass has been exceptional. Is Miami just sort of a natural step for you guys, or was it a very concentrated decision, okay, Miami has to happen now? Well, I think um, we are a real estate firm that is anchored with spectacular technology. And when you look at Miami and you see Silicon Beach, where there's Silicon, there's Compass. 
and I find that um, Miami is an important world center now, uh, just on the same level as a New York or Los Angeles in many regards, but you have blue skies and palm trees, which makes it even more appealing. But like everyone on the stage, I believe we are all uh, interested in Miami, mostly because the uh, clientele in New York is so fascinated by what's happening here. And for the first time, I'm really seeing a group of people who are very skeptical and actually quite unpleasant about Miami, saying nice things about Miami, and especially in the middle of February. So I do think <laughs> that there is a tremendous synergy that exists between Miami and New York, and there's an affinity between the two cities. And because of that, we're here. Peter, in your case, is a little different. A lot of the, you know, the, the panelists here, there's a lot of intersection between what they do in New York and what they're doing in Miami. In your case, you're taking a dramatically different turn. Uh, you're producing luxury spec homes. So talk a little bit about why you came here. Firstly, I seem to need to buy a brokerage firm um, <laughs> to, 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 be, to be on the panel. Um, we didn't buy one <laughs> yet. Oh, right. I, um, I have a home uh, down here for about 10 years, and I guess I'm not good at relaxing. That's probably, you know, pretty much it. Um, and uh, no, I, I, uh, I think Leonard is correct that uh, Miami is a center of uh, more and more wealth. Um, there was an article in the New York Times, I think this week or last week, about the uh, largest uh, donors to uh, soft packs in the presidential election so far. And, and if you look at the uh, map of where people are giving, I think they had categories of $100,000 uh, to you know a million dollars and over. It's pretty much centered in New York City, LA, Houston, interestingly enough, and Miami. Um, so that's an indication of uh, wealth and power. Um, so we got into the sector, and also because I thought I could expand uh, the spec, uh, sector down here um, compared to what was being done two years ago. Yeah, same question for you. Yeah, well, we just uh, purchased recently uh, Zilbert, which was established in 2003. And um, for us, there was a natural synergy with Zilbert. We thought it was a perfect firm for us. Um, there's about 30 agents, and um, we're really happy to be working with them and expanding into this market. In, in some of your cases, like Brown Harris Stevens and in town, there was an alliance with a company in Miami which already has a very, very strong foothold in the product that you want to get into. Andrew, do you want to just talk about that partnership and how it came together? I know you, you mentioned it briefly, but what does that mean for the brokers at town? What does that mean for the brokers at Fortune? What are the mechanics of the partnership? Because I, I'm assuming we have a lot of brokers in the room. May I get a show of hands? So people would be interested in you know, understanding how that came together. Sure. Uh, so um, Edgardo and, and uh, Town and myself have been um, speaking about um, an alliance with each other uh, for about uh, eight to ten months prior to uh, formalizing the relationship. Um, we have identified Fortune International and they've identified Town as a best-in-class local expert. Um, we both had a very um, large amount of uh, market share and similar sensibilities in approaching the luxury market, and we also um, have multi-tier platforms, what I call fully integrated real estate platform, whereby we service luxury, the luxury sales sector from a resale perspective, as well as the new development market from a sale perspective. <coughs> we, uh, town, being that we're from New York and 70 plus percent of the housing there is rental housing, we also have a very extensive rental presence uh, in New York, um, um, which in Miami is not not yet evolved as a, as a business. Um, <clears throat> and um, in addition to that, um, like I said, a lot of our brokers were interested in, um, in the Miami marketplace, either to work, there are some brokers actually that have already enlisted that want to work in both cities. And um, we've duly licensed them between the two firms. So along with um, our president of sales, Wendy Maitland, who's out in the audience somewhere, by in the back over there, um, who's been spearheading the relationship, we um, detailed a very um, elaborate um, uh, strategic partnership, which is a business model that we intend to use in other markets where we feel that it's best to partner with local experts as opposed to having the management and operation risks and costs associated with coming in there um, as a new player. Um, one such market, and I'm, uh, 
not to tip you off on this, might be a, a neighborhood or an area like the Hamptons. And um, so Edgardo and I, I believe we both intend to use this platform and model um, to expand into other markets as well. Um, and the way that it works is um, there is a referral arrangement for um, sales uh, in both directions. There's uh, for, for listings, there's a referral, a referral arrangement for uh, customers in both directions. And um, on new developments or any uh, international travel, w which we might do, our, our new development director, Shlomi Ravini, who's not here right now, um, would go with Edgardo's team um, and travel abroad to present uh, their best new developments and we would present our best new developments together jointly as joint investment opportunities. Um, and so far we've, uh, all cylinders, on all cylinders the relationship has worked. It has worked um, from a rental standpoint in New York, it has worked from the rental standpoint here. We have made commercial referrals down here. Um, um, we have uh, jointly uh, pitched and presented to uh, new development uh, developers uh, here down in Florida and up in New York. It's important to note that um, this is governed by the, uh, the Attorney General and, and state laws, which are um, very, very uh, strict and rigid and need to be abided by at all times, which um, we've, ma we've made sure that we've done. We have a joint education um, where we are educating uh, the fortune brokers in person uh, up in New York and down here. Um, about our projects, about our marketplace, about the neighborhoods that have, that have uh, constantly evolving. And likewise, Fortune has done a tremendous job coming to New York to speak to our uh, agents and representatives about the neighborhoods, um, in, uh, Miami neighborhoods and the evolution of all the new spectacular um, developments here. That's a similar question for you, just the mechanics of the, the, the partnership with Zilbert and what that means. Well, we're working together, for example, um, when we first acquired Zilbert, we had an agent uh, in our New York office who had a referral who had somebody want to list and sell their apartment. So immediately we were able to work together within uh, somebody at Zilbert, the agent took it, got the listing. So, and it's kind of that sort of relationship, it's symbiotic, goes back and forth, we work well together. Um, they recently, a lot of the agents from Zilbert came to the city um, and saw some projects, we sh toured with them, um, showed them around New York, and the same thing will happen with our agents in New York. We'll come to Miami and see some projects and go to the offices. We are actually going to open, um, at the end of October, our new space, which is at the Continuum at the corner, which is gonna be great, and we have um, some really incredible agents at Zilbert that are, go along with the Brown Hair Stevens brand and working in and dominating the high end of the luxury market. So I think it's a great relationship and we're really excited about it. Leonard, uh, you're not, as far as I know, acquiring or entering into an alliance with any other local brokerage here in Miami, right? Well, we're in the business of finding people a great home. And what we felt was that creating an environment for the very best brokers to come who are like-minded and building it from the ground up was probably the best way to go about things. And um, the most important message I have is that we do not want to come to Miami and tell Miami how to do Miami. This is very, very important to us. We really believe very firmly that real estate is a very localized business and has to be kept that way. But the things that we're building in New York and in the other um, cities that we're in, like Boston, DC, going into several other territories very soon, all those synergies do have great value to brokers everywhere. And the agents who join our uh, family, I should say, or our home, are going to benefit by the spectacular tools and uh, mechanisms that we have in place to fuel their business. I truly, as a broker, speak to the power of the individual broker as an independent contractor. And I think it's so critical that a uh, broker in a city like Miami is respected for the spectacular work they've done already. And I don't want to dictate to them how or what they should be doing in their daily roles but rather create a home and an environment and mechanisms and tools and engineering that helps fuel their business where they know that the people who are amongst them are the caliber of agent that they want to be around that helps fuel their business and that has a spectacular synergy with New York and all the other cities that we're in. Ryan, you're sort of the applause, like it. Ryan, you're the epitome of the 
basically the independent contractor where you carry a huge proportion of your firm's listings, you're coming into a market that you know, you're, you're very new in. How do you start? Uh, have you used anything to sort of leverage your brand in New York and you know, come here? Any, any strategies that you use to get in? Well, it's not like I woke up one day and said, oh, what am I going to do today? I think I'm going to go down and do real estate in Miami. Let's go. Um, you know, we had been doing a bunch of referrals back and forth. And then literally a broker in Florida, John, who's right here, he, he flew up to New York, came and found me and said, I'm a broker in Florida and you are going to hire me and we are going to take over Miami. And I said, okay. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of how that started. Um, and then we've started working on developments uh, since then. So what I've always found to be super beneficial, since, especially since the show started, because so many brokers see it, is the power of that broker network and really, really, really using it. And I see it very strongly in Miami and working on referrals and talking to every single broker. And then it's kind of like everybody is one big team. And it's easier to do that in Miami than it is in New York, which is interesting. And how do you, and this is a question for you, and then I, I want to pass it on as well. How do you get used to the difference in pace in Miami versus New York? When I saw you earlier this morning in the hotel, you're like, I have an early breakfast meeting at 10 a.m., and you gave me a little wry smile. Uh, how do you get used to that sort of shift in, in workplace dynamic or the way things are done? It's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I don't really enjoy waking up at 4.30 in the morning. It's not like I, that was my dream. Right? It's what's necessary for me to do what I need to do and to be happy about it. And that's just getting the job done. Um, you know, I don't spend as much time in Miami as I'd like to. So in terms of the pace, I mean, everybody wakes up to my emails. So it's still basically the same. And then I call over and over, over and over, over and over. Um, well, y yesterday uh, in our boardroom at uh and our board meeting we had with Fortune, um, the, the pace was very New York-like. So um, I don't really think that there was much of a difference between the New York pace and the Miami pace based on yesterday's meeting. Peter, as a developer, you want to weigh in on that? Just the style of working in Miami as opposed to New York, or just sort of the, the fundamental differences that you've seen? The style in general is much more casual. Um, here and within that there are some people that have a work ethic to a greater or lesser degree and um, you know those are the people that are successful here in general I find here that it's you, you don't find no but there's no place like New York because New York is just not a, a healthy place uh, there's you know too many driven um, workaholics but you know, here it's like the opposite. You don't find a lot of people who want to sustain an effort um, on any particular task, is, is what I find. You know, there's plenty of bright people, uh, very, a lot of charismatic people, but the difference is like the ability to sustain uh, an effort and or, or to be analytic um, about anything. It's a little bit day, day or night. And how does that impact your business when you're you know, finding, sourcing deals or finding financing or putting you know, ground up construction? How, do you, how does that impact what you do? Uh, is that, well, you, you don't, there's really, there, there's no layer of consultants here really um, to participate in real estate development too much like in New York, like, like even, um, in these guys, like in, in New York, the brokerages often participate with developers in, in new development, right? You know, about the market research or, um, you know, about the, what finishes or uh, layouts to a certain degree. Um, that type of professionalism doesn't exist yet. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity probably for these guys to bring some things that they do in New York down here or for people who are in Miami to adapt um, to those things. Best from a broker's standpoint, would you agree with that? Would you say there's, a, there's something that you can bring to the table from New York that, that works? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a very different place. I mean, New York is an intense city to live in and it's 
you know, serious business, waking up at 4.30 in the morning or whatever. To, you know, people get up early. They work really hard. I think the Miami brokerage is different. It, they also work very hard, but it's much more laid back. I mean, you're on the beach. Um, it's a different vibe, but it's good. I think it, you know, it works well. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for agents to do stuff with new development. Um, and I think, um, you know, we'll see a lot of that happening in the next uh, year or two. Let's shift gears for a second, talk about where the buyers are coming from in Miami. Uh, Leonard, in your research that you've done when you come into a new market, what are you seeing? Is there a shift from the last time you may have explored Miami or you know, a couple years ago? Is there something interesting happening? Well, from the research we have done, and uh, Beth Butler, who heads up our Miami operation, has given me the briefing. Um, we really want to get very deep into data because I think that's going to be very meaningful to the Miami brokers and their ability to not only just have a lot of figures, but actually know how to extrapolate from them the data that's meaningful to them. So um, what we are seeing from a buyer pool perspective is what is normal in pretty much every city around the world in that the buyer pool shifts according to economies. And when the South American um, economies uh, dipped rather dramatically over the last uh, you know, 18 months or so, I think the pool of South American buyers dipped as well. I think as the dollar surged in value, so did the pool of foreign buyers dip. And I think there's been a huge focus right now on domestic buyers. And everyone talks about the New York buyer exclusively. But I think there are people outside of New York City, believe it or not. And I think New Yorkers, unfortunately, I'm a New Yorker, although this accent would belie that. It's Brooklyn, I think. But the um, New Yorkers tend to feel that there's New York and nothing else. And I think that's really bad. I think Miami is an exceptional city with an exceptional level of ability. And what has been built here and achieved already is remarkable. And I think what has to happen is we have to help people build that further. But you will always see the buyer pool shift based on what happens in the economy because Buying real estate in Miami, for the most part, I mean, we focus on Faina House and Continuum, but there are a lot of other places to live in Miami besides those buildings. And there are millions of people living in Miami outside of $10 million apartments. So that's, you know, just one small speck of the uh, market. And I think um, death, divorce, growing families, slowing families, retirement, these are all factors that will constantly drive the market that's very localized. And then there are all the other factors of the international buyer and the foreign buyers that are coming in from uh, the United States market that matter, but it's all driven, those buyers are driven mostly by what, what's happening in the economy. So if in Wyoming people are making millions of dollars finding oil, you could expect some Wyoming buyers here too. So I think you have to follow the money. Peter, you've got any wildcatter buyers in, in, your, in your product? Have you got those? You mentioned a few cities that were coming from in the US. Can you talk a little bit about your, your buyer pool and what kind of buyers you're attracting? Well, first of all, you know, we should qualify. Everything we're talking about here is you know, 1% of, of the market, really, the really tippy, tippy top. Um, so I, from, you know, first of all, we're, we're in design, uh, construction drawings, and we're in construction on houses. So in, we haven't really tested the market that much yet. So we're getting um, a little, little inkling. But from what I see at the high end, um, I call it the um, middle age to older guy who just has sold his business market. Uh, there's, there's a lot of that down here. And the business yeah. happens to be like an oil well or something like no, that? No, you know, it, it's compared. You have wealthy New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. um, you have, I mean, at this 1%, you have a lot of people trying to move money out of South America for political reasons because they're afraid um, either of the current government or the government might change. Uh, with good reason, they're afraid. <laughs> um, and in the States, you know, you have New York, Boston, but you also have people, you know, a guy who had a successful business in uh, Michigan or uh, in Cleveland and, you know, sells his business. And you know what? He doesn't want to live in Cleveland or uh, Michigan anymore from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, October to April because he's tired. He doesn't have to anymore because he's cashed in. So that, that, that's a good part of this luxury market, too. 
Bess, your firm was involved in, in the Faena House deal, which is a record breaker for, for the Miami market. Uh, let's talk about the, the tippy top of the market that, that Peter alluded to. How deep is that pool? How does it look different as, let's say, compared to New York? What's going on? I knew there? you were going to ask me that question. Yeah. Um, I actually, <laughs> I don't know the answer, so I'm going to defer to my friend Peter Fine. <laughs> No, I spoke with some of the agents, um, some of them are Miami agents before about that and how deep the luxury market is here in Miami. And from my understanding, apparently, you know, five years ago, there wasn't that uber luxury market here in Miami. They didn't, weren't building it, it was very mediocre. And now that we have all this stuff coming, Faena House, you have the Continuum, you have that new Project 1000 Museum Mile, all these incredible projects and these star architects, I think, that there's a thirst for it here. And my understanding is that there's a real demand for it. They want it, Their people are buying it, and it's from all over. Like Peter said, it's domestic, it's international, it's a real mix, and I think in Miami, there's a real need for it, and people are, and the buyers are happy about it. I think there's a new pool of buyers coming to Miami as well, by the way, because you have the Silicon Beach factor, you have business startups that I think are very, very important, and then another big one I find is that the cultural elements that are being established in Miami will be a huge draw for people who used to poo-poo and say, well, it's just the beach and palm trees. I think there's a whole new element that's coming to this town. Yeah, yeah the whole, in the condo sector, I've noticed that, um, that the level of design and construction is, is in this cycle is just way past what existed here, you know, before 08 and 09. And um, you also see, like, you know, Alan Faina, what he did in Buenos Aires is, is fantastic. And, and also now I, I know the Fasano Hotel from um, Brazil is taking over the Shore Club here. So there's something happening where you, you know, I don't want to say more tasteful, or, or, or maybe um, real estate companies that are used to catering to uh, um, higher end, more tasteful, more discriminating um, buyers, um, or people staying in hotels. It, it's, it's changing here, it's becoming more sophisticated. And um, frankly, that's why I got into this uh, home market also, because I, I, the part of the business concept is to try to do in custom homes, what I saw happening in the condo market, just like a real ramp up, ramp the game up a uh, little bits, because people who are spending 20, 25 million dollars on a home, um, they're very sophisticated people, and, and you know they're used to quality. They're not going to buy a white vanilla box. Um, Andrew. Um, I think it's very important um, to understand some of the dynamics of, of the Miami market, the new development market today, uh, versus, let's just say, 2006. Um, I think the market here, uh, the luxury market, which is, is a majorly overused word and needs further definition, because really, quite frankly, most of the new developments that are being built are all luxury, and they're just different levels, um, including some of them are um, uh, better situated or located, like might be on the bay or might be on the ocean. Um, but with that said, um, <clears throat> if you see a building that's being built right now, there, there's not really a lot of overbuilding going on in, in Miami right now um, for luxury towers. Um, if a building is being built and it's a luxury tower, it means that it's at least 65% sold before they put the foundation in and come out of the ground. And by the time it even comes out of the ground, because some of these foundations are very elaborate, um, the buildings are usually 80 and sometimes 90% sold. So you might be talking about the remaining inventory there. From start to finish, the whole process is five years. And by the end of the five-year period, the developer should have 100% of that pro product sold. Second, this time around, um, the buyers are being required to put down 40 and 50% deposits when last time, in 2006, they only had to put down 10% deposits and maybe a 10% progress payment, um, uh, which was refundable because the, according to state law, you can only retain 10%. The way the deals are structured now, um, you're allowed to apply the 40% the differential to the construction costs, which helps finance the project. So the only, um, the, the only area where there's an appearance of uh, excessive building or overbuilding um, I really would call it uh, excessive marketing 
um, but not excessive overbuilding because there might be uh, 25,000 units that are being discussed to be developed um, and are being marketed to be developed, but if they do not reach that threshold and if the, if the demand is not there to reach the 65 to 80 percent threshold, the buildings are not getting built. So I think this market is extremely healthy. It's, it's an amazing thing as a broker, and everyone says it to me, especially as having dinner last night with, uh, with some people, and they were saying you know, how, how inviting all of the sales teams are for these projects in Miami, and how when they go to New York, they feel the exact opposite. That you know, the sales offices are okay, or they're small, or they are put together haphazardly, and they, they don't get the kind of respect that you get in Miami which always sounded crazy to me until we started working down here. And my team has about uh, $100 million or so in, in listings between Aria by the Bay and Echo Brickle and the Muse. Um, and those sales offices are mind-blowing. It's so, it's, I, I think the only word I can say is awesome because you get to have so much fun down here and there's so much, there's freedom to do kind of what you want to do and I think there's a huge market for it and I think that's why you see all of these large units now coming. Whereas in New York, everyone thinks there's a glut, right? Here, I was talking about large units last night and everyone said, oh God, we need more, we need more. We're gonna combine this, we're gonna do that. They haven't even seen what it's like just to have funnels and funnels of Chinese buyers come through. You've seen them on the investor side but on the splashy luxury side, you haven't seen it yet. So I think, whereas New York is going strong, I think Miami hasn't even seen, hasn't even seen the height yet. Um, there's one more really, uh, I agree with you 100%. The sales centers down here are incredible and I look forward to learning uh, more about the presentation at sales centers here and taking some concepts that are being done down here and bringing them back to New York for some of our new developments. Um, one other a very interesting fact is that um, on a lot of these buildings, um, you, you, you might ask where there would be a huge demand, where there's a huge shortage of uh, unit type in this marketplace, which would be accomplished, uh, which would also accomplish a certain price point that would be extremely desirable and fly off the shelf, would be if there were more studios and one bedrooms. And I speak to Edgardo about this all the time. I'm like, why can't we just build studios and one bedrooms down here? They'll fly off the shelf, you'll sell thousands There'll be lines around the block. Um, and likewise, actually, the Chinese buyers would be interested in buying studios and one bedrooms because it would land in the price point that they're interested in. And um, the answer to the question is that um, according to the zoning laws, um, you're only allowed to do so many units on uh, the, square, the square acre or the square three acre property. And the way that it works out, similar to in New York where there's a certain height restriction, and you have to make this decision, should we eliminate a floor or two floors and have ceilings that are 10 and a half feet and eliminate saleable square footage? And the answer always is no, even when you go through um, all the different analysis. Um, the, similar to that, uh, when you uh, are asked to, to um, uh, reduce the amount of units that you're gonna sell to offer studios and one bedrooms, it never works out that way. So the way the zoning laws work here actually is prohibitive to building studios and one bedrooms. Gotcha. Leonard, in terms of running a business in Miami, just the, the overheads of running a brokerage business, and I think, Bess, you could talk to this as well, uh, what, what are the differences? I mean, is it a lot more expensive to set up shop in New York or in Miami? Uh, what are some of the sort of the nitty gritties of, of starting something up here? Well, I think the most important thing is uh, understanding the culture of the city, understanding the culture of the brokers, and understanding what works and what doesn't work, and then not fighting it because I think imposing is really what is uh, a great turnoff to the people we've met in Florida. They just don't want that, and I don't blame them. Um, but I do believe New York is always more expensive to do everything in. It's less like London is more expensive than New York. So having a city like Miami where, as uh, Ryan points out, you have the opportunity to build these spectacular sales offices, in New York that's just economically not feasible often Although we do have some wonderful um, sales offices, and I'd be happy to invite you to one or two of them, Ryan. Ha, 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 ha. But I do, think the, um, I do think you have to understand the nature of the business. That's why someone like Beth Butler, who's a veteran of the business, who truly understands how the city operates, understands the personalities, what is right, what is wrong, and what could be improved on. That's the best way to run, but certainly it's more expensive to do it. I think one of the big areas that for us has um, been a challenge in New York that claims to be so perfect 
is the concept of averages. And uh, Andrew brought it up earlier. You know, getting a bit more specific about data is really what matters to developers, what matters to agents. And more importantly, what about the poor consumer? They should be given some better data, data that has real value to them. And throwing out just an average to anyone these days is almost insulting when you have $2,500 and $3,000 a square foot and $400 a square foot. Lump them together, you get an average, useless. I'll give you a little tip just, you know, just to help you out. TheRealDeal.com slash Miami. It's a good place to start. But Bess, uh, just a similar question. I mean, starting a brokerage here or operating a business here, just the nuts and bolts or the cost. Well, we, took, uh, we, we acquired Zilbert, and it's brand new to us. And I can say that it, you know, for Zilbert, the one thing that's great about them is they are the resource for uh, real estate in Miami. The website is amazing, and everybody goes to it. So that's really helpful to us. Um, and it's new to us, so I don't know. But I know we have great agents, and we're expanding, and we have the new office. Um, but New York is an expensive market to have offices to do everything. It's just extremely, it's much more expensive. So I don't know, we're in the beginning. It's a growth period, and we're just very excited about it. So, Peter, just on the sort of zooming out, the regulation level in New York in the type of product you build is quite sometimes after, you know, deal. You talked about a very sophisticated level of government in New York City. Those are your words. And how about in Miami in terms of regulation on the city or state level? Uh, how dramatic is the difference? It depends what kind of housing you're talking about. You're talking about multifamily, sure. high-rise construction, or homes, or let's let's talk multifamily. Uh, multifamily. Well, these guys are all trying to sell um, condos in New York. I've built you know 70, 80 projects, all rental housing. So it's, it's uh, I'm I'm for the 99 percent, um, Leonard. <laughs> Because uh, I know you're a bad guy. You're, you're only focused on the 1%. Um, but no, I'm just kidding. The 1% of the 1%. The good 1%. 1% of the 1%. Oh, right. The point 1%. That's a new category I heard. Um, now, the, in the Northeast in general, but especially in New York and Boston, it, there's a tradition of having a very activist uh, government. Mm -hmm. So in the multifamily space, um, well, first of all, there's 250,000 people that work for the New York City government alone. I think there's another 250,000 people that work for New York State, which is why we pay 12% taxes, uh, you know, in New York between city and state tax uh, for the privilege of living there. Um, so uh, in the Northeast, New York, they feel it's their responsibility to try to create housing for um, affordable housing, moderate income people, middle income people. I'm building a project in Westchester County that's called workforce housing. Workforce housing is for cops and firemen, uh, basically. Um, that, that doesn't exist, really, down here. Um, you have some affordable programs, but it's really not much. Um, as far as building, actually constructing down here, it's just totally different. In New York, we're concerned about logistics, about, you know, tower cranes banging into the Williamsburg Bridge, or, um, you know, how we're going to lodge a foundation in a street that has a subway tunnel. Uh, even if it's 200 feet away, you know, we're in a sphere of influence. Um, here, the biggest problem is that the Miami Beach government keeps changing its mind. Um, about things, you know, which is, right. Um, that, that, that's frustrating. And that's a real problem because, you know, as opposed to other people, I, I'm in the business of deploying capital and risking money and managing risk. That's what I do in the real estate space. It's very, very difficult to deploy my money and manage the risk if they keep changing the rules. So that, that's going to be a deterrent, frankly, uh, for investment here. I want to open up to the audience because a lot of them don't know you, so I want to do a Q&A. But really quick, just going down the line, what phase are you in Miami? Are you actively pitching new product? Or are you actively selling new product? Just very quickly, just down the line. Uh, super active, uh, as active as we've ever been in pitching and selling, in listing, and I think it's only up from here. Um, our relationships, all systems go, and we have 30-plus uh, uh, transactions and referrals in process. 
Leonard? We've just started, but we have a spectacular level of interest in the company, and we have already some pretty outstanding brokers. Peter? Some more active here than I wish to be uh, when I'm here. We, uh, I've bought five lots uh, to build homes between 10 and 15,000 square feet. Bess? Yeah. Oops, Oops, wrong way. We are... <laughs> We are actively selling, and um, we have some agents that are at pitch, pitching some projects as well. Let's open it up to the audience. Right there, sir. I'm an architect, and I just came here from living in Dubai for 10 years. And uh, we looked at some apartments, and I ended up in an old house in Coral Gables because the marketplace, as you said, there's nothing small, but then we wanted an apartment like we can get in Dubai which is basically a three-bedroom apartment that real people can live in, that has wall space, that has some height, and, and so forth. And of course, the law there says every bedroom has to have a bathroom, and you have to have a visitor's powder room. In other words, it's, it's a real apartment with amenities. And yet, I find an affinity here with Dubai, the, looking at what's being built. And I'm wondering why the brokers, as they said before in the last program, don't get involved with this kind of interest with the architect, with the developer. In fact, it intrigues me that we've just seen three programs and I haven't heard a word about architecture. And, um, and, but brokers are just as important in apartments more than in Sorry, houses. Could we get to the question, please? The question is, why aren't you guys working with the, your developer to create stuff for people that real people want to live in, that they've lived in in other places. That's coming, and that's the question that's being asked of us most, actually, by developers. They want an involvement with some really substantive uh, input. Yeah, I agree. Um, we, we are in New York, that's commonplace, and it's actually a requirement of transacting in New York. We've got time for two more. Yes. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Um, how does New York compare to Brickell? Well, how do you see Brickell? Because I, I work in Brickell, I'm be working for Fortune, and it feels like it's so urban, it's like growing, there's a lot of restaurants, a lot of developments. How do you see New York compared to Brickell? What do you see Brickell heading? So um, I'll, I'll take the answer on that one. Um, I used to live at 2333 Brickell Avenue uh, back in 1989. It was by far the tallest, most luxurious uh, residence on all of Brickell Avenue. And when I drive by now, um, I feel like Stuart Little. Um, what's really interesting about Brickell and what makes it so great and so cosmopolitan, aside from the great restaurants and the superior architecture and the great hotels, is that it really offers an urban lifestyle. Um, as you all know, and we didn't speak about, but now we get to do that with that great question. Um, as you all know, there's a little bit of a public transportation issue here. And when you live on Brickell Avenue, you, um, and especially if you live and work in Brickell Avenue, you. Um, are immune to the, uh, the issues with um, public transportation. So it really is a, a true live-work uh, environment. We'll take a couple more. Kathy Sloan first, and then the gentleman in the, with the awesome tie. Kathy. Thank you. Each of you is affiliated with a firm in Miami. And I wonder if you could tell us what the average sale price is for each of those firms with whom you're affiliated in this city over the past year or at least uh, the past three quarters? Even if I knew the answer to that question, which I don't because I'm not affiliated with the firm right now, I would tell you that I would not answer that question because I hate averages. They bother me. <laughs> so I'm not, I abstain. Uh, um, I would say um, a million and a half dollars uh, for condominiums and somewhere between uh, $700 and $1,200 per square foot. Um, Fortune has projects all over Miami uh, and, and up into Sunny Isles and Fort Lauderdale. I believe they have 24 new developments and uh, so it spans all the way from $600 per square foot for uh, you know, $6,800 per square foot for Auberge in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Um, and then some of their other projects, like Jade Signature, could be $1,000 to $1,200 per foot. Uh, welcome to Miami. I am City College, class of 68, engineering. Okay, Ms. Freeman, welcome to Miami. We are an affiliate together with Christie's Realty, okay. right? And um, I am with EWM. 
and we sell a house over $1 million every 13 hours. So you are in the right market. So uh, the question that I have for the panel is, doesn't excite you the level of cooperation of the brokerage community that you encounter here compared to New York that you don't even have an MLS? That's, that's, yes. That's What's the question? <laughs> How many pocket listings? The level of cooperation. Yo no entiendo. <laughs> Por favor, yo no entiendo. Lived I'll defer York, to Peter Fine. Lived in New York, <laughs> Chicago, and Miami. I've been there since 97. Miami, by far, has the most luxurious property in America in comparison to New York, Bay Area, even Rancho Santa Fe or La Jolla. FYI, we're competing with Dubai, Shanghai, and possibly Jeddah. Having said that, can you, uh, can you name how many buildings in New York has a pool? Yeah. I'm gonna ask Leonard that question because they have better data than we do. I don't, I don't have the exact number, but I will tell you, our website is the only one that if you type in <laughs> swimming pool, you will find out which buildings have one. The last we actually, it's becoming a huge amenity in New York, that. and I personally moved into a building to be in a swimming pool. It has one. We've yeah. got the last question up there. Yes, I believe this is unprecedented uh, that New York follows Miami or comes to Miami, descends upon Miami. Um, what do you think? Did it cost you by surprise? I mean, it seems like all of you are following clients and money. Did at any point said you, you, you guys said you know what is going on in Miami? Did, did it cut you by surprise? I have to say, it didn't catch me by surprise. I lived in Miami. Um, I'm barred in Miami. I was a lawyer. I, you know, I love Miami. I, I always knew that it was a great place with culture and you know, diversity. It's an international banking place. It's got a huge port. I always knew it was incredible. It was just a matter of time. You know, the market fluctuates. Um, but for us, it was the ideal time because Zilbert was something that we were, you know, we were talking to them and it was the perfect firm for us for what we do in New York. So for me, no surprise at all. Um, I, I, I think I was surprised a little bit about this cycle, about the level of um, quality of, of the projects. Um, my, my sense was 10 years ago that Miami, it didn't matter that much, the product, because people were here to be outside, uh, to be on the beach, to eat outside um, in restaurants or cafes. And it's definitely, as I said before, it's, there's a different feeling, um, for better or worse, by the way, because uh, we, we don't, what we enjoy is, about, is the authenticity of Miami. We don't want that uh, faux sophistication that from New York to follow us down here. On that note, I want to thank our panelists for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, everyone.